put the thing together. Nehemiah went in there. He had a vision. He heard from God and he did it in 52 days. Can you see that? Amen. Hallelujah. 52 days. That's pretty quick. You better believe it. Because you see, the people had a mind to work. They were single-minded and they had a vision. They had a vision. Okay. Now, verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sanablat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites, in other words, all the enemy, when the enemy heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, in other words, that the walls were starting to come up of the church, and that the breaches began to be stopped, they were very rough. My dear people, that's where we're at. God says, that's where you're at. God spoke to me. He said, son, that's where you're at. And I said, oh, glory! <laughs> huh? I got excited. Why? Uh, the devil's really getting mad now. We're making some headway. <laughs> huh? You better believe it. Huh? He said, and the breaches began to be stopped. In other words, my dear people, we're closing up the breaches, closing up the doors for the enemy that can't get in anymore. We're getting them gapped and, and closed up. And then, if you notice, it says, then they were very rough. They were very rough. If you notice there, in verse 7, it talks about the openings of the wall were being closed. And it says the enemy was very wroth. In other words, he was very mad. But in verse 1, he was just mad. Now, verse 7, all of a sudden, he's very mad. Huh? Glory. That means we're, on the right, we're going in the right direction. Huh? You go in the direction of the, of the uh, resistance. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, I wanted to explain to you tonight, my dear people, when the enemy gets very mad or very wroth, here comes persecution. <laughs> Amen? Here comes persecution. <clears throat> Even your own brother or your own sister will nail you to the cross. Who nailed Jesus to the cross? Religion? The people did not agree with what he was saying in essence. You see, my dear people? The people that nail you to the cross, they begin with the words of their mouth. They begin with the words of of their mouth. That's the reason why you want to walk, watch the words of your mouth. That's what I call the Judas kiss. Because you see, the more you speak, the worse it gets until you first thing you know you are a Judas. How many of you know that Judas went out and hung himself? You better believe it. That happens every time. People are sitting in truth and they don't even recognize it. You better believe it. Hallelujah. Verse 8. The enemy is really very wroth. The boys, he getting mad. Verse 8. And conspired all of them together. The enemy all got together. He called in all of his forces, principalities, powers, rulers of the other, air, powers of darkness. He called them all in, all of his enemies, all of his troops, in other words, to come and to fight against the, the children of God, Jerusalem. And to what? Hinder it. To hinder it. It. Well, my dear people, all of the enemy came to hinder the work of God. They came to hinder the children building the wall. How many wall builders we got here tonight? Glory be to God, get them hands up. Oh, get them up high. Amen. You better believe it. You better believe it. You know, the enemy will do anything he can to stop the move of God. He will do anything to stop the revival in this town. Did you hear me? He will do anything. And his favorite thing is called foxes. We just read about it up here in verse 3. It said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. So that's one of his main strategies. He uses what the Word of God here calls foxes. He will send foxes to break down the wall. <laughs> he will send foxes to hinder the Word of God. The enemy will send foxes to hinder the work and the move of the, of the Holy Spirit. He will send foxes to hinder the ministry God has sent to help build the wall. He has, will send foxes to hinder your prayer time. He will send foxes to hinder and to disturb your peace. He will send foxes to tempt you into sin so that the church will lose the battle. Because you see, my dear people, if there's sin in the camp, you've lost the battle before you began. Did you know that? If there's sin in the camp, you cannot win. It will take the church right down with it. And that's the reason why God is calling for a holy church. Without spot nor wrinkle. Why? Because He wants to win. 
You say, well, God always wins. <clears throat> I'll show you where he lost one here in Joshua. Chapter 7. Joshua was God's man, but he lost the battle. Did you know that? You better believe it. You better believe it. You see, foxes uh, bring rebellion into the church. They bring rebellion into the church. They have a rebellious spirit. They rebel against the Word of God. They rebel against uh, authority. How many of you know that uh, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 23 says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft? Did you know that? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And I want you to ask yourself something tonight. Is the enemy using you as a fox? He has to use a body. Huh? You say, well, I don't know about that, brother. Well, <clears throat> check the words of your mouth sometimes. Huh? Can you see that? You better believe it. Well, none of us want to be used for that. But you know, the enemy, well, I'll tell you, he is a deceiver. He is a deceiver. We can be used in that area and not even recognize it. Judas was used. He was one of the twelve. Then he recognized it was too late. You see, I don't think anybody wants to go out and hang themselves, do they? I don't. <laughs> huh? So you see, we need to constantly monitor ourselves and where we're walking with God. Because anybody can be used if we don't watch ourselves. Can you see that? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all learn anything tonight? Hallelujah. Verse 9. Nevertheless. Oh, I like that word. Nevertheless. <laughs> Amen. Nevertheless. We made our prayer unto our God, and He set a watch against them day and night because of them. Amen. Glory be to God. Set a watch day and night. Against them. Nevertheless, that word means in spite of. <laughs> huh? In spite of that. That's what that means. Nevertheless, in spite of that. In other words, in spite of all the hindrances, they made their prayer unto our God. What else did they do? They set a watch. In other words, they watched for the enemy. They watched for the enemy. You know what the definition of watch is? It's the act or fact of keeping awake, keeping alert in order to look after and protect or to guard what God has given you dominion over. How many of you know that we've been given dominion over this town? Yes. That's right. We are called to watch for what the enemy is doing out there. To watch for the enemy and his hindrances. To watch for the foxes. Uh, you see, Nehemiah, when we begin to study here, was armed and he was watchful. And he was armed. Watching day and night for the hindrances and the onslaught of the enemy and the enemy's strategies. Uh, why? Because of them. It says right there. Because of them. Who are them? Well, if you read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, you'll know who them are. The principalities, powers, and rulers of the air, and the powers of darkness, that's them. They may be walking around in a body, but that's them. We all understand that. I won't turn to that, because you understand that. Let's go on to verse 10. Verse 10. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. In other words, the burden bearers were getting tired. <laughs> The burden barriers were getting tired. In other words, in the word of Jesus, the harvest it truly is great, but the laborers are few. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Then we read in verse 11, And our adversaries said, here's the enemy, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them. Till we come in the midst. You see that? The enemy comes in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to what? Cease. See how the enemy works? He sends in foxes to do what? To kill the people and to cause the work to cease. To do what? To try to stop the church. Can you see that now? Well, the enemy sends in many things. He sends in foxes, but he also sends sin in the camp. I want to show you this quickly. If you turn with me, please, to the book of Joshua. This is very important. Joshua was called by God to conquer Canaan land. Joshua 
studied and worked under Moses for like 40 years, I believe. And then he was called into the ministry. So in the book of Joshua, beginning with chapter 6, verse 27, Joshua, prior to that, Joshua was, had won battle after battle after battle after battle. He was a real winner. He never lost a battle. And in verse 27 of chapter 6, it says, So the Lord was with Joshua. You see that there? The Lord was with Joshua. That's why he kept winning the battles. Why? Because the Lord was with him. You see that there? The Lord was with him. All right. And his fame was noised throughout all the country. Why? Well, because of Jericho and all the battles won and everything else. Verse 7. Chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the, the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Kermai, the son of Zebedi, and the son of Zekah, and the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. In other words, Achan got into sin. Achan got into sin. Now, if you look at verse 7 of chapter 7, And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan? to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, in other words, the enemy, to destroy us. Would God have been content to dwell on the other side of Jordan? In other words, Joshua went to war and he lost the battle. The same Joshua that the Lord was with him. The same Joshua that the Lord was with him. Why? Because you see, my dear people, there was sin in the camp. Sin in the camp. Verse 10 Look down at verse 10. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Because Joshua was crying out to God, God, why did I lose this battle? A man of God will lay before God many times, crying out, God, what could I do next? Or all about this battle, or whatever. But Joshua is laying and he's crying out to God, Why did I lose this battle? And chapter 11, or verse 11 will tell you, God said, Israel hath sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing that they have also stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. You see, my dear people, if you have sin in the camp, you cannot stand before your enemy. You have lost before you start. How many of you know that? You have lost before you start. You can't even talk to God. He does not hear you. John chapter 9, verse 31. The Word of God plainly says, God does not hear the prayer of a sinner. Did you know that? Why? It breaks communion. It breaks communion. So consequently, if you break communion, you lose the battle. Now you say, well, why are you saying all this stuff tonight? Well, my dear people, we want to win this war. We want to win this war. I don't want, you know, we don't want... Some of us to fight and some of us not to fight and this, that, and the other. We want to win the war. Isn't that right? You better believe it. So you need to be aware of these things. You need to be aware of these things. If the, if the enemy comes along and tries to tempt you into something, don't fall for it. Why? He has got a strategy. If he can get you, someone into sin, bam! Sin in a camp. Can you see that? If he can create a fox amongst us, bam! Fox tries to walk the wall down. Can you see that? We've got to be made aware of his strategies. <coughs> me. So you see, the enemy had come in the midst of the children of God in among them to cause Joshua to lose the battle. So you see, sin can cause a church to lose any battle. Because you see, rebellion can cause a church to lose the battle. Sin is rebellion. So why do you think the enemy tries to tempt us when to sins of the flesh? Huh? I'll share a scripture with you here in uh, huh, Romans 8.1. Turn that with me real quick. I want to show you something here. In Romans 8.1, <coughs> the Word of God says, and we've all heard this, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. It says, there is therefore when? Now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. But the whole problem, everybody's preached that, stops. Well, the first sentence, and don't go on. Because it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's right, there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus that walk after the Spirit. 
But man, I tell you, you get into the flesh, here comes a condemnation. Why? Because you've opened the door for the enemy. You've opened the door for the enemy. Can you see that now? All right, you say, well, how, how can I, how can I uh, <coughs> uh, know the difference? Well, I'll tell you how to know the difference real easy. If you don't know the difference, ask God to bless what you're about to do. You'll find out real quick. <laughs> huh? Isn't that right? Ask God to bless what you're about to do. Huh? Huh? I said that to a guy one time and he quit smoking because of it. I said, you shouldn't smoke. He says, well, there's no condemnation. And I said, well, that's what you just ask God to bless every one of those you light up. For some reason, they quit. <laughs> Amen? That's not to, uh, why? Because sin separates man from God. He doesn't want us to be separated from Him. Okay? All right, thank you, Jesus. Something I want to point out to you, I made a little note here, is what people don't realize if they continually get into sin, the heart starts to harden. And it becomes more and more difficult to get in the presence of God. People don't realize that. But I've ministered to people that have gotten into blatant sin over and over and over, frustrating the grace of God to the point that they... We had a lady here one time. She could never get in the presence of God. It was absolutely incredible. The grief that she kept going through. Because she tried to get in the presence of God, it's just gone. It's gone. Well, I believe it will come back to her somehow or other, someday. But because of this blatant over and over again, frustrating the grace of God, is what happened to her. It's a very severe case. All right. So, verse 12. Back to Nehemiah 4. We're getting close here. Thank you, Jesus. Well, verse 12. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, they said to us ten times, from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. They will be upon you. Who? The enemy. They will be upon you. Who? The enemy. They will be upon you. 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 Who? The enemy. In other words, the Word of God is telling us that if we don't watch for the enemy, he will be upon us. Why? <clears throat> it's very simple, my dear people. How many are Christians? Are we all Christian in here? Huh? Yeah. Who do you think his enemy is? Christians. It's not the guy standing in the pub. He's already serving him. It's Christians. Let's wake up. Wake up, church. It's time to wake up. Realize the strategies of the enemy. And that's the reason why he said in verse 12 there, ten times they will be up on you. Why? Because we've got to watch for the enemy. You've got to be sensitive and watch for the enemy. Verse 13. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and the higher places. You see, after he heard ten times that they were going to be upon you, Nehemiah said, hey, I'm going to sit and watch high and low. <laughs> I'll tell you something else. I sit and watch high and low too now. Huh? Don't you? Aren't you going to sit high and low and watch? It says, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So Nehemiah is saying there in verse 13, watch and pray. You see, not, Nehemiah constantly prayed, combined prayer with preparation. His people trusted God and at the same time kept vigilant watch over what had been entrusted to them. Very important, people. Too often we pray without looking for the role that God wants us to have in that prayer. Too often we pray without thinking. We just pray. But we need to say, God, what do I need to pray about? Well, if you don't know what to pray about, pray in the Spirit. Well, then you'll be praying His perfect will. So we need to watch for the enemy and pray against his devices and his strategies. And also, if you notice there in verse 13, it says, Notice the weapons and the swords. He's talking there about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Well, we all know how to wield the sword of the Spirit, don't we? Can you see the weaponry there? Spears, I don't have time to get into it tonight, but they are representative of intercession and prayer. Spears are the lance, a part of, it, of the weaponry. Verse 14, it says, Glory be to God. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of who? Them. them. Glory be to God. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight, what? For your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your 
houses. Why? Because the enemy will come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Be not afraid of them. Who? The enemy, my dear people. Do not be afraid of the hindrances. Be not afraid of foxes. Be not afraid of anything that the enemy might try to send. Be not afraid of them. My dear people, remember that Jesus is not the undertaker. He is the overtaker. Huh? He's the overtaker, my dear people. Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord. In other words, wake up, church. Wake up. What was that? Verse 14? Okay. Hallelujah. Nehemiah uh, 15, verse 15 of chapter 4. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught. Glory be to God, He brought the enemy to naught. And we returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. In other words, when our enemy heard that it was known unto us, that we found out who his strategies, who he was, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we're not afraid, that we are armed, and God is on our side. Glory be to God. How many know that God is on our side tonight? Yeah. You better believe it. You better. So what happened? Everyone returned to the work on the wall. Can you see that? Hallelujah. Now here is what you want to be very... Uh, underline here, verse 16. Remember Saturday, I said, you know, we need to do something. Remember Saturday morning? I said, we need to do something. Verse 16. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half held the spears, the shields, and the bows. You know what he's saying there? As half of us are out there working, the other half have got to be praying. It's that simple. That's exactly what's going on. That's exactly what's going on. So from that time forth, half the people worked on the wall and the other half of the people held the spears, the shields, and the bows. So you've got half the people that were working and half the people were praying or, in other words, interceding. The same time they were working on the wall. Exactly the same time that they were out, the intercession is going. That's what we need to do. Can you see that now? Okay. So, and then what happens? Together, together... The whole church, in other words, built the wall of power and protection against, uh, to protect God's church and place of worship. And then in verse 17, it says, They which built it on the wall, and they that bore the burdens. You see, there's two different groups of people there. You've got the builders and the what? Burden barriers. Hallelujah. You've got the builders... And the burden barriers, and those that laid it, everyone with his hands, his work, wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. So we see builders building the wall, and then we see the burden barriers. Everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work, and the other hand holding a weapon. So we have builders, and we have burden barriers. How many of you know again that we are his body, his hands, and his feet? Can you see the strategy that God is giving us here? And how it has to work for us to build this wall that he wants to be built around this town. Can you see that now? Okay. A wall of power and protection for God's what? Lighthouse. God said he's going to put a lighthouse here. We're it. I believe that in all my heart. But he's giving us the strategies to get us there. Can you see that now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, you see, we won't turn to this, but the prophet Isaiah ministered during a time of great sin in Israel. And God desired to spare the people from judgment and to hold back a judgment and he, until intercessors could begin to pray for the people and for the lost and the unsaved. But as time passed and no one interceded, finally Isaiah spoke these words to the people. In Isaiah 59, 16, he said, And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, or in other words, prayer warrior. Well, the Hebrews at the time failed to understand the importance that that, that was God uh, as time passed. So he, he spoke the very same thing again to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 22. The very same thing. So we need to be aware of what God is trying to show us tonight. He's saying, okay, you need to work and you need to pray. And at the same time. Okay. Hallelujah. Then we look at to verse 18. For the builders... Everyone had his sword girded by his side and so builded. And I love this. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Glory be to God. <laughs> uh, uh, 
He that sounded the trumpet was by me. He that sounded the trumpet by me. In Jeremiah 4.19, the Word of God says, Oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. My dear people, the Lord is telling us tonight, Hey, wake up, church. You are in a spiritual war. You are in a spiritual battle. Yes, you're out here working. You're building these walls. But, my dear people, you've got to maintain the things of the Spirit at the same time. You still with me? Okay. Now, praise God. Now, look at Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 1. We're about to wrap it up here. Hallelujah. Well, in 52 days they built the wall. Amen? In 52 days they built the wall. And in chapter 7, verse 1, the Word of God says, Now it came to pass when the wall was built. You see that there? Nehemiah 7, verse 1. Now it came to pass when the wall was built. And I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed. So I want to point out to you there in the first sentence it says, Now it came to pass when the wall was built. You got that first sentence? All right. Then, I want you to notice to the ministry tonight that the wall did not build itself. The wall did not build itself. The builders are the witnesses. The burden barriers are the prayer warriors. And it took hard labor and a lot of prayer to get that wall built around Jerusalem. Okay? But I want you to look at verse 5. Glory be to God. I about jumped out of my chair. <laughs> when I was sitting at my desk, I, God showed me the help this scripture. And my God put into my heart, together, together, the nobles, the rulers, and the people, that they might be reckoned by genealogy. God told Nehemiah to take a census. Amen. Woo! Ah! When? When the wall was built. Huh? Did you see that? He told them to take a census. You know what? I've never saw that before. Praise God. You think we're not on the right track? You better believe it. He told them to take a census, my dear people. Hallelujah. So you see, God called for a census after building those walls. And he, of course, he appointed the gatekeepers, which stood guard to keep the enemy out of the city, out of the town. And that's where we're at. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, praise God. You know... In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2. Thank you, Jesus. In Nehemiah verse 2, the enemy thinks that the church is feeble, not strong, ineffective, and easily broken. I want to ask you something. Is that you tonight? No. Hey? Is that you tonight? No. Hey? No. The enemy thinks the church won't fortify themselves. They're not committed to rebuilding the wall around this town. Is that you tonight? The enemy thinks that you won't sacrifice for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that you tonight? No. Are you sure? Amen. The enemy thinks the church will only last for a day or two. Is that you tonight? No. The enemy thinks the church doesn't care about the rubbish being revived in this town through revival. Is that you tonight? No. <clears throat> well, my dear people, if, it, if that is not you tonight, it's time to stand up. It's time to stand up. Stand up with me. Amen. Stretch your legs. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hallelujah. It's time to stand up, my dear people, and to be counted, church. 